you know, years ago, uh, probably about five, six years ago now, I, I wrote in my book, Fallacy of the Calorie, dietary cholesterol has nothing to do with your blood lipid levels. That's what the data showed. And from a lot of my peers, you know, that's, uh, I, I caught a lot of grief about that. Still do. Yet, just a few years ago, the government got rid of the daily uh, requirement in terms of cholesterol because they said there's no data. And yet you still have professional organizations saying don't eat egg, egg yolks because they have tons of cholesterol and people, you should just have an egg white omelet or worse, a synthetic egg with God knows what it's made from. Hey, welcome to Unlatched Mind. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Michael Fenster, aka Chef Dr. Mike. Um, Dr. Fenster is a is a board certified uh, cardiologist, professor of culinary medicine, and, uh, and a professional chef. Dr. Mike had written an article uh, titled "Why the War Against Red Meat Is a Red Herring," um, and so we we framed the discussion around that. But we we went, you know, we circled around all things cholesterol and the the you know the egg white omelet debacle and 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 you know, hey spoiler alert eat the whole egg it's fine um so uh anyway uh, uh dr mike has some 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 really good insights and he's obviously super qualified to have some of the opinions he has and, and he has the data to back it up so anyway let's just jump in i give you chef dr mike well let's kick it off dr fenster thank you so much for your time really appreciate it oh um, thanks video glad to be here yeah, yeah. So your your article, why the the war, you know, why the war against red meat is a red herring, right? I I, read, I, I saw that. I'm like, okay, yep. I'm I've always been, I don't know. I, I you never know what ground truth is with food and nutrition. I don't. I feel like we're still figuring it all out. And there's, but but before we jump into that, because I think I agree with you on most topics, on most of this, okay. like 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 wholeheartedly agree. And so it's not going to be much of a debate. You, my but, friend, um, are a rebel. <laughs> really? Oh well, there might be oh, some. Yeah. There might be some. There might be something in in your writing that I missed. Then that's that's controversial, <laughs> but um, it seem seem common sense to me. But we'll, we'll dig into that. But before we do, maybe uh, who are you? What do you do? And a little background sure. on yourself, maybe. Uh, go by Chef Doctor Mike because I am both a chef and a physician. So I'm an interventional cardiologist, uh, board certified. And for folks that don't know what that means, uh, when people have a heart attack, two o'clock in the morning, I'm the guy they call go in, put stents in, uh, that sort of thing, fi fix uh, coronary arteries. Uh, uh, also, before I ever even went to medical school, uh, I uh, <clears throat> learned to cook professionally. I started as a dishwasher to help pay my way through college, work my way up through the ranks back in the dark days before the internet, before there were celebrity chefs <laughs> uh, and nobody wanted to do the job because right. all your buddies were going out at, at Friday and Saturday and you know, by the time you finished at 2 a.m. smelling like dirty dishwater, nobody really had much use for you. So right. uh, those two passions of, of food and, and health have really kind of defined my life. I've got personal reasons for discovering the path to culinary medicine. I had my, my mm -hmm. own challenges with joints, um, which really stem from being... Uh, a much worse athlete than I thought I was in my teens. Uh, when, when I w went in, did sports, broke bones, tore mm. ligaments, tendons, uh, you know, etc. And uh, you pay for those down the road a little bit. Sure, and yeah. a large part of that was my diet. Um, you know, uh, as a professional chef, I've since gone back, got my culinary degree in gourmet cooking and catering. Uh, oh, but as somebody who knows food, who grew up with great food, yeah. you know, Medicine can be pretty demanding as an intern and a, as a resident, particularly back in the day before they even mm. limited hours. And so I got away from my roots and it turned out right. that a large part of you know my suffering, my challenges were self-inflicted, um, you know, bad dietary choices. So I emphasize, I empathize with everyone out there that's confronted with this. This is my life. This is my passion. And I can tell you, it's hard for me to sort through the data. So, yeah. you know, I really, my goal, the way I see it, I'm here to be a resource. I'll give you the information, uh, share it with you, what I know, <laughs> uh, what's my opinion, what the studies show. And, you know, it's up to everybody to have their own individual relationship with, with yeah. food. Yeah, 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 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you hear that old cliche, you know, food is either a poison or, or, or a cure, you know, depending on what you put in your body. And it's, I mean, you only really 
the only thing we in, we ingest is food, right? And so, I mean, yeah. food and drug, I, it's all it's all nutrition. It all breaks down biochemically to this, you know, to various things. So it's either you're putting things that are in line with what your body needs or, or, or not. I think I do, everyone would agree with that. It's just that what is and what's not okay is, I guess, well, the, the constant I take debate. One, I, I'm going to take you one step further, Vinny. We're going to we sure. shatter some myths right out of the box. Yeah, um, yeah. Everything you said, absolutely 100% correct. I agree with that. But I think what we're really learning on the edge of science is it's even more than that. So, mm. for example, when we look at things like the Harvard Happiness Study, we find out what is it? That, it's a simple question. So what do we have to do in our life to live the longest, be happy, have wellness for the best yeah. part of our life? Is it our cholesterol level? You know, is how much money we make? Uh, is it our socioeconomic class? Turns out, according to the Harvard Happiness Study, that it's relationships, but relationships. it's the quality of those relationships. Yeah. Similar data from the Dan Butner and his group out of National Geographic with the Blue Zones. And so when we look at food, for me, uh, food is an experience. Um, mm. You know, it's it's social currency. Uh, there's, you know, food is processed in the same area of the brain as, as sex. So to mm -hmm. say that love and relationships we have with those uh, important people around us is simply based on, you know, biochemical urgings to reproduce or, you know, so on and so forth, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think really misses the human experience, which we know contributes to the richness of our life. And for me, um, and I think the data is starting to support this, we're looking at things like functional MRI, uh, structural yeah. MRI studies, etc., that our relationship with food is, is one of those critical relationships. So in culinary medicine, as we teach at the University of Montana, as I do, it's, it's one step beyond that nutrition. And, and and I want to get and I think that's important because I want to get out of that box yeah, that yeah. Well, food is medicine. You know, it's all about the calories, man. It's it's all about you, Vinny. It's all about your experience, your relationship yeah, yeah. with food. That's the template. Well, you're you're certainly onto something. No, you're you're certainly onto something because I mean, okay, I'm Italian, right? I check all uh, I check most of the Italian stereotypes, like quite literally. <laughs> we, we after we stop recording, I'll tell you some details. But 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 food is a bed and it's such a huge part of our life. I mean, it's just you know, I mean, growing up and so you know, you know, you're at you're at breakfast, we're talking about what's for lunch. We're at lunch, talking about what's for dinner. Dinner, we're gonna go whose house we're gonna get you know, my family was gonna to go to someone's house for coffee and, and dessert and it, it and it's such a social you know, my grandmother, you know, they've all passed now, but you know, when I was a kid, you know, if I didn't eat for some reason it was. It was not like oh, he's just not hungry. It was a, it was a blow. It she, she, you could see her heart breaking. It's like what, you know. It's so there is there is such a social element. It's such a, uh uh, uh the, yeah. You you it really is part of the the, the human experience. I mean, a hundred percent. And if you even a lot of the diets and this this diet one diet two. There's all these diets out there, and you there's I think there's like these Noom apps and other apps now that are trying to help people with you know and they may be you know I don't know if they're worth it or they don't work or but but they at least they're trying to add the psychology of what is the relationship to food doing like they're adding that other layer so um yeah I think you're onto something for sure I mean I don't I, I can't imagine that's controversial um some people I think just you know eat just to live I'm kind of a live to eat person like I really I, I love everything about it um so I think you're onto something for sure well, I think so. I, it, what's interesting is, you know, in the, from the medical field, though, we we tend to really focus on things that we can put numbers on, like calories mm. or percent RDAs, things that we can measure. And for so long, we even th separated out, right? There's mental health, then there's physical health, as if the two weren't connected. And yet what we yeah. know now, I mean, everybody's heard of the placebo effect, right? That means about roughly give or take. 30% of people heal themselves with the power right. of their mind and their belief. Now Increasing, that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty, pretty impressive yet. We kind of dismiss that out of right. hand. So I think there is a, a, some movement in medicine, Western medicine I'm talking about now, cause obviously whole, um, kind of a more holistic approach. Eastern medicine's done that since existence, but there's sort of a coming back together now and understanding that, for example, I'm a cardiologist, um, People hear all about cholesterol levels from cardiologists. People don't hear about depression, which is as a potent risk factor for having a heart attack as any cholesterol level. Um, mm, but as a cardiologist, yeah. I never write a prescription for like, Vinny, go out, do something, be happy today. But right, it turns right, out that's right. incredibly important. Right, right. Go, 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 go do some exercise and or ha and have a meaningful yeah. conversation with somebody, which would yes. no matter you know every study would show increases your mental you know your your, your mental state. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, so, so what, so, so what prop, first of all, I guess, uh, 
the title of the article, like I said earlier, is is it will kind of frame the conversation around that, and we'll see where it goes. But you know, why the the war against red meat is a red herring? Um, what before we jump into it, what prompted you to write that? Is that was it just as part of some of the research you were doing, or? Well, the, the research I have done, and and mm. I see things like this, you know, quite often. Again, it's it's almost a parallel for me in terms of uh, the salt argument. You've you've probably heard, oh, Americans have to cut down their salt. We've got to get salt out of the diet, so on and so forth. But um, and people can read my articles on Atlant in the Atlantic uh, on, online and Pacific Standard and uh, other places. The data really hasn't changed. Uh, but what we come to find, and this is by many professors and other experts, is that taking uh, salt out of our food only makes us miserable. So mm -hmm. decreasing dietary sodium doesn't have um, inputs. In fact, uh, there's an article, my last, uh, one of my latest articles on Psychology Today uh, looks at that uh, because of a particular study that was done looking at the beneficial effects for certain patients with increased salt in, in, their, mm. in their diet. And so, you know, part of what frustrates me is, you know, uh, I love food. I'm a chef. Yeah. And to, to hear kind of these sound bites that are full of misinformation or misdirection where red meat's bad. Um, let's look at that a, l a little bit more closely. Let's find out, you know, what's really going on here. Is that really what the information says? Or right. is it maybe telling us something else? Or is it um, directing us, you know, uh, to look a little more closely in other areas leading to new hypotheses and, and um, you know, discoveries? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I find it, um, you know, that's just kind of one of my missions. And and, and it doesn't make me popular. You know, years ago, uh, probably about five, six years ago now, I, I wrote in my book, Fallacy of the Calorie, dietary cholesterol has nothing to do with your blood lipid levels. That's what the data showed. And from a lot of my peers, you know, that's, uh, I, I caught a lot of grief about that. Still do. Yet, just a few years ago, the government got rid of the daily uh, yeah, yeah. requirement yeah. in terms of cholesterol because they said there's no data. And yet you still have professional organizations saying don't eat egg, egg yolks because they have tons of cholesterol and people, you should just have an egg white omelet or worse, a synthetic egg with God knows what it's made from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. we're finding out that that's probably worse than anything. So Didn't we learn this from the whole craziness. margarine thing. I feel like we should have learned this from the don't eat butter, eat margarine. Really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, yeah. I, it's, it's amazing that that's still going on and that that theme. Now, I'm a layman. I'm not in the medical field at all. I'm just curious about all this stuff. And I listen, I listen to I consume a ton of podcasts, a ton of audiobooks, and just read stuff. And I thought that whole egg white omelet thing, I almost thought like we were all like, oh, man, we really screwed up there and telling people to eat egg white omelets. I thought that was common knowledge now that the, the wholesome nutrition is in the whole egg and mm -hmm. eating consuming cholesterol is not going to give you you know, base, base bloodline, high cholesterol. And I, and, and is that true? I mean, I think that what I, that, like I said, that, I think that, that's true. You're, you're exactly right. And yet, okay, yeah. you know, there are careers that have been built on, on mm -hmm. that, um, Sounds, yeah. you know, well, you still shouldn't eat so many eggs, you know, blah, blah, blah. They don't even give you a reason. Maybe they don't even give you a reason why, but there are professional organizations that do that. <clears throat> I was traveling not too long ago and, and they're on the menu at a restaurant, I have a heart healthy egg white omelet. So, yeah, you know, it, it, yeah. it gets out there, it gets in the mainstream. Maybe the science wasn't very good 50 years ago when some of these recommendations came out, but it's just been repeated so long. Everybody buys into it. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so th that's why that's that's one of the things um, that that I do. I'm here to say, well, here are the facts. Now, if you don't like eggs, if you're Guy Fieri, he hates eggs. Mm. He's not worried about his cholesterol, at least as far as I know. I, I'm yeah, not his yeah. personal physician. Mm. But he's like, I don't like to eat eggs. Great. Well, don't eat eggs. Um, mm. But if you're telling me hey, don't eat eggs because uh, they're bad for you from a health perspective, th then I, I would take issue with that statement. Right. And, and the data, that, that's I mean, the kind of information I'm here to provide. Sure. I mean, you're a scientist. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I'm an engineer. I'm a scientist. Show me the data. Let's talk yes. about it and not let it get. I mean, incentives are everywhere, right? It, right. If you follow the rainbow of, 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 of when any organization or any movement is, is taking a position. You follow that rainbow that the pot, at the end of it's a pot of incentive yes. and that pot of incentive yes, is right. money. So it's yeah. an unfortunate reality. So you always have to be kind of, okay, well, where are you getting this? And why is there, you know, um, so, so, uh, yeah. So, so you're, so you're, so the, so the article, um, you kind of touch on three at first when I read it, I was thinking, okay, it was going to be strictly about, you know, the health, you know, whether or not eating red meat is healthy or unhealthy. 
you know, and you can, you can, you know, break that. I think you kind of really took, took, uh, you broke it down into kind of three components, yeah. the, 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 the kind of sustainability slash climate change aspect of, you know, eating red meat, eating beef, cows, you know, um, the cattle industry, uh, the, you know, the, the actual health aspect is consuming it healthy or not. And then the ethical consideration. So, um, I feel like if we, if we could, because most of the article was on the sustainability piece. Um, so, yeah. I mean, where do you, where would you rather focus? I'm mostly interested in the health health side, but um, we can kind of go anywhere. Um, you want to maybe start with the health side? Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm happy to discuss any of that. Okay. And, and first and foremost, um, you know, I want to say again, I'm not here to change somebody's uh, opinion or even really change a diet. Just put the information out there. Sure, yeah. A ton of my Let fr- them make friends, a decision. Uh, my best friends are vegetarians and vegans, and we get along just fine. Sure. Um, and, and I respect them and for a lot of them, that choice is an ethical choice. And mm-hmm. that's not something I'm here to argue. Cause that's, that's a personal, you know, belief right, and, right. and, you know, you do what's right and everybody, uh, regardless should do what, what's right for them. Um, so right, I, right. I think that that piece is self-explanatory and off the table. That's personal. Right? Um, yep. yep. And, you know, however you want to talk about the other two, I'm happy to talk about both. <clears throat> I focused a little bit more on the climate change for the article purposes uh, because I've written so much about the health aspects uh, okay, that right. we can get into. And and this is a, a, a little bit different. And it, it, to my eye, it was as if people were trying to use a health argument which failed and kind of put a fresh coat of paint on it and sell mm-hmm. it to you as well. I, you didn't believe that you could that if you ate red meat you were going to die. That hasn't really worked so well. So I'm going to get you to stop eating red meat because now you got to save the planet. Yeah, and, the, and the conflation. That, of so the, I, I explore right. that a little more deeply. Yeah, yeah, and I like that's. I think I had sent in the notes I had sent you. <clears throat> I like that you broke down the three kind of components of it because very often, which you just kind of you just kind of you know articulated, very often those three key components, while separate, you know, people conflate them. And, yes. and, and I have the same kind of perspective you do. If someone's like, oh, I don't eat red meat, it's unhealthy. I'm like, well, okay, well, do you really know that? Is, where's the data? Are you eating McDonald's cheeseburgers, quote unquote, red meat? Or are you eating grass fed, natural, you know, big difference. And we'll get into that. But, um, yes. or if someone says, look, I don't like factory farming. I don't like the way the animals are treated. Roger that. I mean, no, I, who can argue that, right? I mean, that's, I'm not typically one of those people that gets into a lot of that stuff at least i haven't but the more i look into it i i find the factory farming thing what we put those animals through is despicable to be honest i, I would love to be able to, if i had the resources and the time and people say we well, just gonna make the time but i would love to just hunt my own food kill it ethically and just feed my family like that i wish you know i think that would be an amazing thing um but you know because I, I i just that, so that one aspect i totally agree with you but um it, it so in terms of the, the health thing um i mean let's just start off Fresh red meat, is it healthy or unhealthy? <laughs> from your perspective, from the data you know. And, and I'm going to go back to what you just touched on, Vinny, because I think sure, that sure. does make a difference. So how we raise our animals, um, mm. the animal husbandry act of, of this, I think is critically important. And unlike you, I, I'm not a fan of con- CAFOs, we call them, or concentrated animal feeding operations, or anywhere the animals are, in, in my opinion, mistreated. Yeah. As a chef, um, you know, as somebody who in the past has hunted their own food, I remember a, a story, you know, it's one of the first times I ever gone out hunting. I didn't learn to hunt until I was in my 20s um, with my ex-wife and her in-laws who owned a lot of farmland on Virginia. And we'd go out and hunt venison, at, you know, every fall. Mm, and yeah. it was really interesting to me kind of talking to the old timers, right, who really knew the ways of the woods and yeah, had yeah. kind of grown up on that. And you're like, well... Mike, you got to learn to take that deer down with one shot because if mm. you shoot it and the animal is stressed and runs, even if it's 100, you know, 50 yards before it drops, the meat's going to be off. Yeah, it's like, got wow, about a whole really adrenaline and whatnot running through the. Yeah, yeah right. it changes yeah. the character. Now, imagine an animal spending its entire life stressed like that. You know what it does to us? It gives us diabetes, obesity, heart disease, yep. cancers, exactly. etc. So it's it's to me it's it's not the best tasting food from a, a chef sort of selfish perspective. Mm. To just ethically, like you, I, I have a problem with mistreating. I part of what we do in culinary medicine is understanding again tying back in those mental aspects. And we yeah. know that mindfulness combined with eating, so how we eat totally apart from what we eat, but how we eat uh, can affect our health, our personal health. So introducing what I call an attitude of gratitude, where I try to make sure at each meal I stop 
whether it's, you know, 30 seconds or three minutes and, and be thankful for whether it's a plant, an animal, a fungus, whatever, that has sacrificed its life to be on my plate today. Mm, and all the people yeah. who work to bring it to me, we can actually show and have shown those are actually called MB eats in the literature or mind based eating awareness techniques or, or therapies. And uh, mm. they've been shown mm. to actually lower measurably lower markers of inflammation and things like that. So we change wow. our, our own body state from this kind of crazy American Western civilization hyperdrive. We bring it down a notch and, and we allow our parasympathetic, our healing aspects to come forth and it manifests mm. in measurable ways to us. So, um, you know, the first thing I want to do is look at how that animal is raised. If I, if I can't get something wild that you're talking about, and even if it's wild, I want to know, you know, how is it, you know, taken down? How is it processed, et cetera? Mm. And, you know, animals, this has been shown in some studies, for example, when animals are fed what is not their natural diet. So many people think cows eat corn. Cows are ruminants, so no. their natural <laughs> diet is grass. They, grass it's yeah. not a natural diet of, of corn. It's a different grain for them. Um, when they're fed things like GMO corn, which can, t can contain levels of herbicides, et cetera, Per, per, uh, particularly Roundup or, or glyphosate, yeah. those things can affect their gut bacteria uh, and actually make the animals essentially sick. And they can do the same thing, yeah. with, same thing that can, we're learning can happen to us. So I'm very particular if I'm going to eat meat or I'm going to get a farm fish, how is that raised? And as you said, it can take a little bit of work, um, but yeah. I've identified sources and and part of what we teach in a course, we call it the culinary medicine art of sorcery. And it's about <laughs> paying attention to, yeah. you know, I, I asked three questions, you know, how is it bred? So is this a, a GMO farmed Atlantic salmon, a, a farmed Atlantic salmon, or is it a wild Alaskan salmon? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what was it fed? So is this, you know, corn that was raised organically or is it GMO corn? that's been treated with tons and tons of herbicides, et cetera. And finally, where was it led? So was there any post-processing that went on? If so, you know, what did that involve? Yeah. So I always ask those three questions, particularly when I'm, I'm sourcing some new ingredients. And when I answer those in the way that I like, um, then yeah, that, that would be my serving of uh, fresh, you know, red meat. Having said that, when we look at some of the data from things like uh, a study, study was now done almost over 10 years ago by Micha, M-I-C-H-A, I believe, et al. out of Harvard, where they did a meta-analysis looking over 1.2 million people worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, what they found, and, and this is a landmark study in my opinion, because it was one of the first studies to say, well, there's red meat and there's red meat, right? There's processed, like you said, uh, burgers and sausages with tons of additives, and then there's a steak. Right. And is there a difference between these two? And what they found is that when you ate four ounces of fresh red meat, so you just made a hamburger patty at home, yeah. um, you know, you know or, or put a steak on a grill, something like that, you didn't increase your risk of heart disease, you didn't increase your risk of, of diabetes, et cetera. But if you ate just two ounces per day on average of highly processed things, so you stopped th at the drive through got that super processed patty, you increased your risk of heart disease by over 40% and your risk of diabetes by almost 20%. Mm. And I think a study like that with those powerful numbers, other studies have shown the same sorts of things. And so we have to be very wary because of the reasons you said, when a new study comes out and says red meat is bad, it's like, okay, which red meat are you talking about? There's a lot of yeah. red meats. Right, right, right. Yeah. Are these epidemi epidemiological studies or? Yeah. Or Okay, so they, well, they, they, there's, there's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, because, because I, what, one thing I was reading about and heard, and again, it, it, I always wondered where ground truth is on this stuff, but, but a lot of the proponents of what exactly what you're saying is saying, well, a lot of these studies saying red meat is bad, is bad, are from epidemi epidemiological studies. I've told myself I will not say that word too many times, <laughs> um, but I think I nailed it twice. No, but um, you, did. Um, yeah, you know, awesome. is, is where they ask folks, hey, how many day, days a week do you eat red meat, and. Yeah. That was where the question ended. So people drive going to the drive through McDonald's would be would be weighed the same way folks that would maybe, I don't know, kill a bison in their backyard yard in Montana and, you know, and eat it and feed their fit. You know what I mean? And just and freeze yeah. it and eat it. So there was no there was no difference there. So it's like kind of like, well, you and those folks eating McDonald's are also 
much more likely to be sedentary, much more likely to have bad habits, much more likely to be obese. So it's like, okay, those studies in and of themselves can't f- fully, you know, stand on their own, you know, without other data. So, um, yeah. I, I think that's true. There's a, there's a lot of um, difficulty in doing any kind of those analysis. Um, and there are very few studies, unfortunately, looking at the, the questions I just brought up, which is yeah. if we're getting, you know, something that's uh, pastured, uh, free range, raised humanely, which usually means that it's more expensive because they're keeping yeah. it on the farm longer instead of, you know, from the time the animal is born, you know, nine months and, and they're cutting steaks off it. Those animals are bred, uh, pigs yeah. especially, for example. So they live in a cage and they're just made to gain weight, get fat, make, grow make quickly food, yeah. versus heritage breeds, which are often grown uh, or raised, I should say, um, for flavor. And they take, you know, two, sometimes three times as long to mature. So as a chef and somebody who's going to take the time to enjoy the food, I'm always about that flavor first. So, you know, one of the things I say is, well, maybe I don't eat as much beef. I don't need a 48 ounce porterhouse, but, you know, six ounces of something that's really good that I'm going to take my time and enjoy and experience, get into that food experience, you know, Mm -hmm. um, enjoy it, taste it. Right. Um, Actually taste it, you know, have a sip of that red wine and just let it all swizzle in that. Yeah. 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 Not just hold it down. Yeah. 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 Exactly. exactly. You got it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, I'm a pig too. I can do that and, and savor it, but I can do the 48 ounce too. So I, 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 I kind of want both, but um, yeah, it's amazing too. You'd go to the grocery store and you'd see, you know, grass fed beef. Like that's a big deal or organic food. Like we, we stamp organic on food to, and that shouldn't it just, shouldn't that just be called food and the other stuff should be called. Well, that, yeah. The, it, it's a shame that we have to label it separately yeah. and then oftentimes pay more, sometimes yeah. significantly more, more yeah. to get food the way we've eaten it as a species for, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Right, 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 exactly. Sad yeah. commentary. No, it, it is. But food is for profit, unfortunately. Yes. It's for profit. It, I mean, what's huge business? I mean, huge business. yeah. I mean, I don't know how you get out of that, you know, again, the end of the rainbow discussion we had earlier. But <laughs> so what is the link to sugar? So so this whole, you know, with the data that I see, again, I'm a layman, so I certainly I certainly want, you know, at, you know, be relying on your opinion here, but or, or your 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 knowledge here. Um, sugar seems much more evil to me than all these other things we're talking about, or well, at least the, the red meats and the fresh. You know, seems it. But the, even so, thoughts there. Yeah. So uh, for the audience, general rule of thumb: stay away from doing lots of fine white powders of any substance. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and sugar well sugar is. Uh, sugar is, is definitely one of them. I mean, mm. our sugar consumption is massive. And, and part of the problem is that it comes in these many hidden forms, right? So, yep. you know, you pick up a label and you see things like brown rice syrup, dextrose, maltose, you know, and and you read on, cane high juice. Fruit corn syrup. And then you yeah. see a little sugar, then you go, well, that's not too bad. There's just a little sugar down here. These labels are by weight. Right. What they've done is is you know tease out all the different sugars label them individually so they can put sugar or sucrose you know at at the bottom and we just it's it's in everything i mean um there are drinks that are like vegetable drinks that you think okay well um you know that's a vegetable i'm gonna get my serving as a vegetable i'll just have a vegetable but unless it says like 100 percent juice and you read the label a lot of them will be have high fructose corn syrup sweetened bread Um, they, I don't believe they do this anymore, but not too long ago, when you went through the drive-thru to get that hamburger, the bun was loaded with sugar. Yeah. And the reason wasn't to give you a sweet sensation like a dessert, but as you talk about, and this is a, was a great book by um, David Kessler, former head of the FDA, uh, lots and lots of information. Um, for my taste, it was a little... I love this stuff. It was a little dry. You could tell it was written by a, a doctor. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of... I'm kind of killing my own book sales here, but yeah, right. uh, you know, sort of <laughs> study after study. But what he described is is the industry, and so mm. things are crafted with with an eye towards what's called a bliss point, meaning that uh, if you eat a, a chip or a crisp, a you you want a salty crisp, right? We want a salty potato chip. Uh, but if I add a little bit of sugar as a background note, then I could put more salt on it. And oh, yeah. it, it yeah. rings those reward centers in your brain even brighter. And when I combine salt and sugar, which are two sort of primeval yeah. cravings for us, 
with fat, then I, I amp the game. So it's like just cranking right. the, the bass notes on that, you know, so the room is shaking. Yeah. And so it's these combinations of and manufactured you can't stop. foods. You open up no, a bag of well, Doritos. I mean, Cool Ranch Doritos, forget it. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll get out of my way. I mean, I, I you know, well, I, I, it's, it's my it's favorite. It's <laughs> layers of sugar, salt, fat, the texture, and the textural elements yep. of, the, of the crunch. And actually, then the food is made to be very soft because it turns out we don't like to chew. When we chew too much and there's too much crunch, that cues us that we need to slow down and stop eating. We're mm. getting full. So it's 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 a it's a hard science with the end game of selling food and selling lots of it and something you want to come back to time and time again. And sugar is just one of the hooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had done a podcast a while ago, and it, it, you know. And the gentleman was basically like, you know, uh, I forgot what episode it was, but um, you know, it, it was a fantastic, a, a fantastic perspective he had. And he's just like, well, you know, the industry now with the science and the food sciences, they're hacking the system, right? Like, wait, like sweet used to be, at the, you know, back in the day, sweet used to be good because you'd, you maybe you didn't eat for three or four days, you'd find it, you'd find a fruit or vegetable that had some sweet to it. It was rewarding, and you wanted so much of it because your body was saying, well, there's nutrients in there. Go, go, go. Maybe, you know, 100,000 years ago. And now sweet is, but there was a process there, right? You had a, you had a, you know, you know, you had to maybe find it for, I don't know, three days. So you, obviously you were doing a lot more physical activity to get that thing, or you're climbing a tree or whatever it was. But now it's just like, you know, the, the rewards there at the end without any of the process to lead up to it, right? It's like well, you're hacking the yeah. system. Well, I talk about this in, in the book I mentioned, Fallacy of the Calorie, and you're spotted. So at one time, that was kind of a survival advantage, right? So yes, if right. I could find something sweet, and you and I are out on the Serengeti, uh, you know, 250,000 years ago, and Chef Dr. Mike finds this juicy apple, and now I've got available glucose in my system, and the saber-tooth tiger comes out, man, you're a little slow on the draw yeah, right, there, Vinny. Right, you right, didn't right. get that. Exactly. You didn't get that. You know, so I lived, I lived to survive another day. So something like that, something like salt, because as omnivores, yep. which our ancestors were, we had to add salt to our diet. So exactly. we had to seek it out like modern day chimps do. So those were survival traits, but they've been hacked to, and been turned into an Achilles heel mm -hmm. uh, right. with the modern right. industry. Right. And, and the health consequences, I think, speak for themselves, they're huge. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking up the episode now. It was it was my episode 19. Te uh, Technology is hacking how we interact. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the yeah, Dr. Noam Spencer. If anyone wants to go back, listen to that. episode 19. Fantastic episode. I mean, it was really. It was just. Uh, um, I'm looking at this, the comments now on YouTube. It's a cesspool out there. <laughs> People are crazy. Um, but yeah, but he, you know, he basically summarized exactly what you just summarized in that there's all these things are kind of hacking the reward systems. And he talked about the sugars yeah. and the, the fats and the salts. And there used to be a, a precursor to getting to that reward. And now we're just, even juices, right? Like, like you have a, there was no juice back in the day. There was no apple juice or orange juice. And I, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll let you get away in here, but I think generally they're healthy, but not as healthy as eating an apple. You're going to get a lot more fiber. That that you know that fructose is going to digest slower, lower blood spot. You know, but then we like I'll just you know I'll just jam thirty apples into a glass and chug it. It's like your body's kind of like okay, that's probably better than not, you know you know artificial sugar or you know, but still kind of a different way our bodies are meant to handle sugar. No. Yeah, and so you, you, you hit on when you mentioned fructose. So yeah. fructose is handled differently uh, by our, our body when it's readily available. So sucrose is a molecule of glucose, which is kind of our body's one of our body's go-to fuels, along with free fatty acids, and a molecule of fructose. And fructose is handled differently by the body. And when a lot of fructose is immediately available, it, uh, it it causes a number of changes, none of which are really good. Mm. And that's one of the issues that we have with the consequences of high fructose corn syrup. So even until the yeah. 70s, the <clears throat> sugar was, was kind of expensive to use as an ingredient. And then high fructose corn syrup came in super cheap yeah. and is super sweet. And so all of a sudden that got added to all these like soft drinks, which sure. I think are one of the big banes of our society yeah, yeah. Um, and you can make them cheaper and but now you have a lot of this you know fructose immediately available which causes the body to start to store fat it actually shuts down in some studies shuts down your hunger center so you're eating things with lots of available fructose 
but but your your body saying I'm hungry, I'm hungry, right, I'm getting hungry. Right, right. And um, yeah. so those, those sorts of things. And, and one of the things that happens is when we create those fruit juices, we disrupt the natural way in which fructose is released with all that fiber yeah, that's yeah. really beneficial for us. So I, I'm not a big fan of uh, fruit juices, you know, per se. I, I don't drink a lot of them. I, I drink lots of water. Uh, carbonated water if you're going to drink your fruit juice um you know if you ferment it and get a little wine or, or barley and hops uh th that's shown to have oh, some benefits yeah. and, and that's not a bad way to go either <laughs> yeah 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 nice no, speaking my language um yeah it, it's 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 almost like if you look back when the government subsidized corn and i don't know what year that was that was uh, whatever was mm -hmm. that part of the agricultural revolution i don't remember when you know but then everything yeah. every you see if you kind of trace from there on it's like well Okay, the, the you know we don't have grass fed. You got to pay extra for grass fed. Why they eating corn? Why are they eating corn? Because corn is basically free, right? I mean, yeah. and then the the fruit those corn serve everything. It's like everything's from corn. I mean, it's and there was an, yeah. there was a documentary on Netflix. Like, gosh, yes, you know the name of that one? It was, uh, it was a while I'm, ago. I'm trying to think. There was, it was actually based off a book, I believe. Okay. Uh, and I, I read that some years ago. Uh, it was quite well done. Yeah, and yeah. I really thought well. anyway, and, and the research seemed pretty good to me. And it just really traced back how our our food, you know, is obviously based on our agriculture, mm -hmm. which, as you said, is is derived from corn. So th there's corn in everything. Yeah. Um, right. You know, whether it's some of our fuel products, um, yeah. you know, Ethanol, into yeah. things yeah. that we eat. And people think, oh, well, you know, I'll have some corn on a cob, I'll have some popcorn, watch a movie, but not really realizing that corn is in so many of right. the processed and particularly what we'll maybe get to discuss is these ultra processed items mm. um and and that's where the some of the real links to disability and disease that we see in um you know as a terms of a consequence of our diet manifest yeah so the one one article that i i, I want to ask you about um it was and i don't know i i read about it i've heard of, i heard it on a podcast got two three years ago i've, I've heard it re uh, referenced over and over again. I just and I kind of looked looked into it, and I I did see it on the New York Times. So I don't know if you're familiar with it or what, what, what you what you think. You know, if there's any foul play here, but in the in the in the because they're they're claiming foul play was wasn't play, but yeah. in the 1960s, the sugar industry paid uh it, it you know they paid basically paid scientists to downplay the the you know, how bad sugar was and put all the blame on saturated fat uh, in terms of heart disease. <laughs> That that's that's true. Um, mm. I go into that in my new book, Food Shaman: The Art of Quantum oh, Food. Oh, you do need okay. Uh, we could do a whole podcast on there. Yeah, basically, what you have, and we, we talked about sort of the powers that be. Yeah. In the fifties and in and sixties, there were sort of two different camps. Um, one was led by John Yudkin, who was a professor out of Great Britain, who said, you know, what really seems to be the problem here is that there's sugar in everything, kind of what we were just talking about. And it's being added to everything right. and sugar consumption is going through. And he actually wrote a book about it. In the United States, the leading proponent was Ansel Keys. Uh, and he's the father of the cholesterol saturated fat hypothesis um, saying, you know, no, no, the, the, the problem is saturated fat. We need to get rid of saturated fat in the diet. You know, Yudkin's research is BS and, you know, went back and forth. And as you can see, um, in terms of, and this this did actually get very political in the early 1970s. Mm. Uh, Keyes was very influential. He, in fact, he was on the cover of Time magazine, mm. um, you know, for this. And in, it was in the early 70s. So we're talking, you know, getting on 50 years now, half a century, yeah. when and we talk about these things being put out that. Um, you know, just because they've been repeated over and over have become kind of the gospel yep, of, yep. of food and nutrition. And, and that's where Keyes came out and said, no, you know, it's it's saturated fat. And, and he won the politics of the day, mm -hmm. which is where we got the governmental recommendations um, <clears throat> that came from Hubert Humphreys Senate subcommittee hearing. I believe it was like in 72, 73. Don't quote me on that for sure, but it was around then uh, time that, that Keyes published his very influential seven countries study, um, so on and so forth, that, you know, 
it was like, okay, case closed. And I was talking to this with somebody earlier today. I said, anybody, anytime anybody looks at the science, particularly when it comes to science and health and food and health, it says there's no room for discussion. The case is closed. It usually yeah, means the case is pretty open. Right yeah. There, yeah, and, yeah. and so they came out and said saturated fat. And, and it won the politics of the day. Mm. And so half a century later, we're trying to turn the ship around. Right. Um, we're still telling people you can, eat the, you can eat the yolk of an egg still to this day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh uh, yeah, well, the interesting. I'm, I'm glad you. You know, I was. I'm a little reassured that you backed that up because I, I've been quoting that for years to people, saying, "Just eat. You can eat red meat for God's sakes. Just eat the freaking yeah. Eat a real omelet." Um, what do you think of the food pyramid? Is it crap? Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad it, it was dumped. I mean, you want to talk about th- bad things? We're talking about bread with all the additives yeah, of, yeah. of sugar and 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 salt and unwanted types of fats. Most po- people exa- don't realize, for example, that. Uh, bread is one of the major sources of salt and sugar in the diet because mm. it's there's so much in it. Again, that subliminal background notes, but we yeah. eat a lot of it. And if you look at that food period, it was telling us to have a bowl of cornflakes uh, more than you know a, a raw vegetable. I mean, come on, who, who thought that up? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean that right. Eat eat cereals, the ten serving or whatever. Industry, right? So so I'm I mean. glad that that got dumped, but. One of the things that we focus on in culinary medicine is is really looking at food in a new way. And, and we've been talking about it, kind of dancing around it a little bit um, in our conversation here. Yeah. When we we're talking about whether well, there's red meat and there's red meat, it's how it's raised, etc. And this, again, was published, I think, um, well, the first paper, I think, came out roughly around a decade ago, too, uh, out of the University of Sao Paulo, I believe, uh, from Brazil. Mm. And it's called the NOVA classification, N-O-V-A, for anybody right. who, who wants to look that up. Actually, you can find it if you just do that and, and type in the United Nations, because this classification system uh, has been adopted by the United Nations and many other countries worldwide. But fascinating to me that when I talk to colleagues, meaning physicians, nutritionists, healthcare professionals, uh, certainly chefs as well in this country, very few people have heard of it. What they did is uh, they looked at food and said, you know, just like Mike and Vinny are talking right now, this idea of red meat or fresh vegetables, uh, you know, a, a, a broccoli or fruit, it doesn't make sense, right? Because you could say apple, but do you mean apple juice? Right, right, right. Do you mean, right, right. you know, an right. apple fizzy? Do you mean eat right. an apple? I had a salad today. Well, what does that mean? What? Did you have yeah, some lettuce and vegetables with a piece of salmon on it? Or did you have, <laughs> you know, ranch dressing, croutons, bacon bits? Yeah. I mean, you could, what does did, it mean? Did you, have, did you have lettuce doing the backstroke exactly. and some ranch yeah. dressing, That's you know? Right. And, and, and so they said, you know, it just doesn't really make sense. Um, so let's look at food. And they divided into four classifications. Um, the one that's important is what they call a level four or, or four classification, mm. meaning it's ultra processed food. Yeah. Now, to give you an idea, depending on the studies and things you read, that's somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of what the average American eats. Mm. So we're not talking that in, in the modern Western diet or, or as we call it, the sad standard American yeah. diet. Oh, yeah, we eat a little ultra processed food that far away is the majority of what we eat. Mm. And they, they've just shown really good data showing correlation between how much of that you eat and your level of disability and disease in yep. terms of obesity. And by obesity, I don't mean that people are just overweight. I mean the detrimental inflammatory system-wide, body-wide inflammation that is true obesity truly correlates with uh, increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, certain types of cancers, Mm. you know, arthritis, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, I want to stress because somebody will say, hey, wait, Chef Dr. Mike, correlation is not causation. Correct. Uh, but that is a good place to start. start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and there actually is some information coming out because when we look at uh, societies in which they don't have access to those ultra processed foods, so um, certain what we might call more I, I, I technologically challenged folks, I, I don't like the term primitive peoples, but you know more of the hunter gatherers, people who don't have yeah. access necessarily to those foods. We don't see the disease that we see as a consequence of uh, our diet. And one quick example, this I believe was part of the MESA study, M-E-S-A, uh, which looked at the risk of uh, developing cardiovascular disease by looking at how much calcium is in the arteries of 
folks as we get older and the more calcium in there that does what's called a calcium score can correlate to your risk of, of having heart disease mm. so uh, that's a kind of way we can look and we study without mm. having to go in and, and take pictures of the heart artery so uh, what we call a non-invasive way and we generally assumed that as you got older it was inevitable you'd have you know more calcium as part of the aging process yet uh again i think this was done in brazil but it was definitely a south american tribe uh, that they did the scans on. And to give you an idea, I believe roughly, if you take the average sort of 50-ish year old male, significant disease is found in about 60% of, of people. If you just, you know, randomly screen folks. Um, it was something like, I think, 3 to 6% in this tribe. Wow. Uh, wow. So what they took away from that is that, oh, you know, and obviously they're also very physically active. Yep. All their food, the bulk of is far and away, fresh, unprocessed. They do eat meats, gay meats, lots of fish uh, from the Amazon basin, as well as lots of plants and a, 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 a diet rich in a variety of plants as well. But what it shows us is that, wow, this isn't necessarily inevitable as a part of right. aging. Maybe it's a more a reflection of lifestyle, particularly what we choose to eat. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, it just seems, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm always worried about confirmation bias. I talk to folks like you a lot because it just seems to be where the data is going. So I do probably need to talk to other folks that have the opposing opinion, but I, I just I just see it full of I just see it full of holes. But again, confirmation bias, sometimes you hear what you you know, you I'm reinfor you're reinforcing right. what I was already thinking, but, yeah. but you're also quoting data and you're also an MD that looks so I, I think there is some, you know, I don't like when folks just disqualify that because, oh, you listen to the same old folks, but they're also very qualified to make these these, these assertions. Well, so I'd, I'd, I'd invite anybody to pick up a copy of uh, Food Shaman, mm -hmm. which is the, the latest book. Um, Fallacy College is a little older, but but similar uh, information. And just look at the re references. So yeah, yeah. I, I had an issue with my publisher because they're like, Mike, come on, you're costing us, you know, X amount of money because because you have 40 pages of references here. And I was like, listen, if I'm a cardiologist and I'm telling somebody they can have a steak, I and I define exactly what those criteria are, I better have the data, you know, right. to 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 show them. And so, um, you know, there are, are footnotes and the references are there. I, I I don't like somebody giving me opinion and saying, well, as you said, well, you know, that's just bunk. OK, maybe it is. But but tell me why. Um, mm -hmm. Let me hear your thoughts. Let me hear the signs. Do you have some supporting or cooperating evidence? And so the you know, the evidence is there. You can look up the study and then make up your own mind. Right. And you could say, Dr. Mike, I, I chef, Dr. Mike, that's crazy, man. I do not believe that. Mm -hmm. And you can read the study and say, wow. Yeah, you're right. Right. Um, or, you know, I disagree with with what you took away from, you know, from that, because um, I've seen that abuse, too. Yeah. I've seen where people quote studies. And when I've actually looked up their reference, I'm like, wait, that's not what this study says. As right. you said, it was sort of they read a headline that confirmed what they wanted to say, exactly. but right. the study right. actually right. said something else. So right. it's all there. And, and the same thing in our course, you know, at, at the end of each lecture, there's a list of references, there's papers. And I, I ask the students, hey, you're going to get an A if you disagree with me and you agree with me. Right, right, as long right. as you know you could support your thought process, it, it's about getting people to think again, Vinny, instead of just these 140 characters. How dare you? By, How dare you, sir? <laughs> yeah, and you know <laughs> right. we we adopt it like a religion, right. and then there's no arguing with it because it, it becomes something of faith, something personal. Mm. Um, then we get all the ad hominem attacks of which I, I've received, you know, I received some more the other day, you know, sorry, Do chef, Dr. Mike's, you know, full of bunk. He's flat out wrong. The pure trial never talked about, you know, fruits and vegetables. It was yeah. saturated fat and cardiac disease. I was like, yes, that was the first paper, but I actually sent them my copy with my highlighted notes saying, here's the pure, you know, study on vegetables. Right. And then what I got back was, well, the other studies you're talking about are bunk. I was like, okay, Stanford. University of Washington, yeah. University of Florida, peer review journals. That's your opinion. You're, you're totally entitled to it. But but let's be honest. Let's be intellectually honest about it. Well, no one um, wants to have a conversation you, anymore. You're right. A conversation yeah, like and, this takes an hour plus. And we're, you know, now if we were debating, it would be an hour plus of discussion. But, you know, we're not debating. But, but yeah, it's the 140 character, whatever it is now, two, whatever Twitter it, does. And yeah, it's just, whatever. it's typed, go. I'm, an, I'm anonymous. I'll say whatever I want, throw bombs, yeah. quote one thing, find whatever I'm looking for online. And by the way, when you type what you're looking for online, you'll find what you're looking for. Looking so for, yeah. people don't even understand that sometimes. And it's like, how about we have a conversation, right? People always like, well, what, yeah. why did you start the podcast? Because to, 
to to encourage me to think more and get with folks that like to think and have an hour plus conversation each every few weeks to think. That's it. Yeah. God forbid. And, and I can tell you, I, I, and I'll be, I'll be honest, you know, my opinion on certain things has evolved as the data has evolved. Yeah. So, you know, um, as it years should, ago, yeah. um, uh, I was like, oh, wow, you know, um, I think maybe these plant based margarines, as we were talking, yeah, right, right. you know, might, they, maybe they're better than, I mean, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Vinny, I was telling patients all the same things, you know, that the, the mainstream cardiologists are telling them. Um, until I, I sort of had it hit home with me. And then I had to do my own research and, you know, rediscover my own roots and said, well, wait a second, what I'm telling people, maybe that's not right. And that's a hard conversation to have with yourself. Um, it, it is. And to go it's back your, and, and yeah. say like, you know, hey, you know what I said about butter. And I looked up and I was like, and I searched the literature and this, this blew me away. I could not find one study that compared butter to margarine in a head-to-head -head comparison to health outcomes. All the data was extrapolated because butter had saturated fat from what we talked yeah, about earlier. Right, right, right. And in fact, looking at the data, people who ate butter on a regular basis, I'll, I'll own up to that now, uh, organic butter, yeah. uh, reduces your, your risk of developing diabetes by like 4%. Mm. So the butyric acid, which is where butter comes from, right? That's one of the big signaling molecules of a healthy gut bacteria mm. is uh, the butyric acid is a, is a signal my short chain fatty acids. Mm. So uh, butter has antimicrobial uh, properties as well in the age of COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, so, yeah. so all these things, you know, but, but it was a sound bite and I was guilty of it as well. And, and you know, I, right. I would say, you know, show me the data. I'm going to keep an open mind. That's how science moves ahead. You know, what, yep. fat, what I love is that weird thing that, that's outlying in this quadrant. And it's like, well, that's real, but that's strange. You know, to me, it's like a, a plate of, of like, wow, I would have never thought to pair, you know, um, this with limes. Right, right, right. Um, that's crazy. Right. Um, but I got to try yeah, it. I yeah. got to go investigate yeah. that. And holy cow, you know, this is absolutely delicious. delicious. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you haven't, you didn't, you haven't built a, a, a platform on, you know, research and in, in publishing, you know, a lot of these folks, like maybe they reached that impasse that you reached about the, bar, the butter and the margarine thing, and they just a lot of folks, a lot of scientists, a lot of doctors double down on the day, you know, what they've been preaching all these years because they don't want to call themselves out. It's not intellectually what? honest and it's selfish, but I understand that position. It's not an easy, you know, they may, they've maybe built a career on position X, and now the data is overwhelmingly disproving X. What do they do? They double down on X. So it's unfortunate. Well, that's what they, and, and I'll say it, I'm a member. I love a lot of the work they've done. I've been a keynote speaker for the American Heart Association, mm -hmm. but I, I'll call them out when I need to call them out, right? And they, they're the ones who came down and said, well, yeah, we see this data on egg yolks, but, um, you know, then it was it was like, well, we still don't think you should eat them. And then I think their their last back step, because there's the data really is overwhelming now, yeah. as we we're talking, where it's like, well, a few eggs, you know, can... Uh, be part of a healthy diet. We guess it's okay if you have to. Uh, but again, that's, you know, that I have a problem with that um, because they built these positions. And then, you know, right. as I say, anyone who can't tell you that they were wrong, um, I don't trust them. Right. Um, yeah. You know, right. I'll tell you as a chef, you know, I, I put these dishes out there. They, they look great. They test, they taste great. Um, but I've screwed up in the kitchen more times than, you know, anyone can imagine. Um, you know, and, and if you look at the, the history of, of food and medicine, it's just chock full of, of errors and retractions and confusions for all these reasons. And we start need to start having real conversations about it. And that's why even talking about a category like red meat. Yeah. And I think we, we pretty much nailed this on your on your podcast because a great direction by, by you, because I'm like sometimes over here and over there and uh, everywhere. But right. We, we can't talk about red meat. Mm -hmm. we, we've got to talk about is it fresh and if it's fresh right. is it you know how is that right. raised is it a heritage breed heritage breeds oftentimes the types of fats and fat distribution is different so people talk about kobe beef or wagyu beef right so they have a different type of genetic basis for fat deposition and types of fats mm. um heritage certain breeds of heritage pork it's fascinating because as a chef i realized this i was working um 
I, I volunteered to go help a butcher, you know, one night so I could learn to do some pork butchery and, and do my own and then yeah. save me money, and, you know, learn some stuff. So I was working with Abe and he had these in, incredibly, I mean, they were raised, you know, on the farm, in the fields, yeah. just doing what like happy pigs like to right. do, you know, and just eating stuff. Yep. And, but when I was working, the pork fat was melting in my hands because mm. of my body temperature. Oh my gosh. Now, if you go to the store right. and you buy, you know, um, some pork spare ribs or some pork and you work with home, that that layer of white stays solid at room temperature. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but working with these, it was it was like working with with duck and and mm. duck fat, uh, foie gras, I should say. One of the main components of foie gras is oleic acid, which is what you find in olive oil, yeah. which is one of the reasons it starts to melt with like at room temperature. Yeah. So, you know, there's, so there's so many starving layers right there. Now, I mean, like, it, that's why me. I love it, man. It's like I a good know, meal. I know, I know, I <laughs> know. killing me. It's, I'm starving. Oh <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. Um, now I do want to touch on one thing. I wasn't planning on it, but you, sure. you keep mentioning the calorie, the calorie fallacy, your book. The fallacy of the fallacy calorie. Of the right? calorie. Uh, so it, 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 this is always boggles my mind and I, I'd love to, I got to get your take on it. So conservation of energy, you t right. It's, it, it's, 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 we all know if you eat generally, if you eat less and move more, that's going to you, you're going to make progress and obviously there's ways you can regress but what is your so i think i'm i'm, I'm going to assume by the title of your book it's not all about calories or maybe calories don't matter at all i don't know i'll let you speak to that but but it's something that's been the debate's been there forever you hear hormones not calories calories in calories out the type of calorie the mac you know again it's still and i go again i'm, a, I'm an engineer it goes back to like physics you know energy is not created or destroyed it comes in it's got to go somewhere so i, I it gets, starts to hurt my head so summarize what your th thoughts are on carol so you're gonna love this because we'll end with an engineering yeah, type yeah. story cool all right. right up your alley it's like we rehearsed this so uh, the calorie came about um because of engineers um not not food so it was the industrial revolution and a steam engine mm. and that's a genesis of a calorie so I had to work on a way to power my steam engine most efficiently mm. as a machine, mechanical efficiency. Yeah, you get yeah, that, yeah, you're an engineer. Yeah. And so um, it, most people think of a calorie in terms of energy. Oh, it's the energy. It, it's not, right? A calorie is actually uh, the amount of heat generated um, mm. in the process of raising a kilogram of water one degree Celsius at uh, at uh, what we would call sea level or, or zero atmospheres, or one atmosphere, I should say. Um, and uh, so it was developed as a measure of heat. Mm -hmm. You can convert, uh, it's 4.2, uh, one calorie equals 4.2 kilojoules, and, and, and joules are actually the, the energy of, uh, measurement mm -hmm. of energy, energy. and, and yeah, there's yeah. the, the transfer. So that should tell us something about the story right away, right? That it's not measuring energy, it's measuring heat produced. Now, how do we get a calorie? So in the 18, it's late 1700s, early 1800s, they developed something called a bomb calorimeter. So I take that apple that we had right. that we're going to press later, make apple juice, and I put it in this device and I basically blow mm. it up. I incinerate yeah, 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 yeah. it. So there's nothing left but ash. And then I look and say, how much did my water heat up? And that's how many calories are in that particular apple. Um, now, most everyone, I think, will agree. One of the few things we can agree on. Unless you are Mesistopheles or Sauron the Great, nobody metabolizes an apple like right. that. Right? We eat it. We chew it. Right, right. There's what's called an efficiency of extraction. Did you cook it? Because then you can take more energy out of mm. it if it's been, been cooked or processed or treated, et cetera. Um, so this idea that somehow calorie amounts equate with health become con became conflated. The idea behind that um, was developed by somebody named Wilbur Atwater. And we still use his name today because you can go to the government and look up in the, the Atwater index the caloric values of different foods that the government keeps. Well, Wilbur Atwater said, you know, it's the Industrial Revolution, but we still have a lot of things that are done by human and animal labor, right? Yeah. People were still using, you know, horses and things to plow yeah. their fields and whatnot. So what things contain a lot of calories that we can feed people and animals Mm. So they can do work for us. Mm. That was the original purpose of a calorie to find food that was calorically dense. So you could feed it to people cheaply mm. and they could do work. Right. Had nothing to do with health. Right. 
And yet over the years, it's be con become conflated to be, you know, if it has less calories, it's better for you, et cetera, et cetera. And, and long story short is that because of all these things like the gut microbiome that we've only really learned about in the last yeah. 10 years, the processing epigenetics, uh, our own uh, nutrigenomics in which our, our, each of us are individual on how we react to foods and, and its components. And the very fact that there are comp uh, food components, not just calories that determine health. To me, the, the conversation of calories is irrelevant. And I'll, I'll end maybe with one last study, for example, that looked at a Mediterranean diet. So eating things very fresh, mm -hmm. uh, what I call a Mediterranean approach, unrestricted in terms of calories. You could eat as much as you wanted. Uh, folks were healthier by all measures, actually lost weight compared to a low fat, you know, American sure. recommended yeah. diet, caloric restriction. Uh, people were just miserable and, and didn't really lose the weight. And, and 95%, 90-95% of these caloric <clears throat> restriction diets, after five years, people have either gained it back or gained more, back yeah. more weight for a num number of other reasons. Right, right. Now, now, I'll push back a little and tell me where I'm off here, but but generally speaking, so it, it certainly isn't the entire story. I don't, I, I, Roger, I 100 percent agree with that. Now, but a person eating 2,000 calories a day for six months are going to have a certain amount of like, exactly the same behavior, you know, exercise routine, health, you know, stress, everything. And then six months, and then for another six months, they double their calories. They're going to be fatter, correct? You know, at the end of the day, um, in a very gross way, you could kind of look at that. And, and I would agree with that. You know, it's particularly true at the extremes. So if we take in massive amounts of calories each day, we're going to put on weight. At the other extreme, if we calorically restrict ourselves, so at, at the margins, yeah. we're going to lose weight, regardless of whether it's low fat, you know, low carb, you know, whatever. Um, but... And, and there was one study done, and forgive me, I'm blanking on it, but but it actually is in the book, where they looked at this and said, let's in one diet restrict fat, one diet restrict protein, one diet restrict carbs, and look at different measures of how that yeah. affects the body and the immune system. And it turned out they had all had different effects. Mm. So even within the sort of this realm of caloric restriction, what you restrict has significant um, impact. So um, I kind of look at calories like miles per gallon in your car, right? Like you go yeah. there and they go like, you're going to get 50 miles per gallon to this. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, if Mike's driving it in Montana back roads, uh, which are dirt and full of potholes, right. and Mike didn't check his tire pressure, and I haven't tuned my engine, and I haven't changed my oil in two years, I may not right. get the recommended miles per gallon. Vinny's very meticulous. He's an engineer. He knows all about this stuff. He checks his tire pressure every day. Everything's yeah. perfect. You know, Vinny's actually getting 70 miles a gallon. Mm. So, you know, it gives you a ballpark, I think. Um, but with that being said, you know, again, six months down the road, your body's changed. Yeah. Right? You're six months older. So right. caloric needs and things are different. I just find that it's not... It's not a useful guide in terms of food um, going by calories. What's much more useful to me is the adoption of, of uh, the NOVA classification yes. and looking at foods and meals in terms of are they ultra processed or are they real and wholesome? And if you do that, then you can go by the delicious factor. Yeah. Like this sucks and it's not delicious and I don't want to eat it right. versus this is absolutely delicious. I'll take more of that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll I'll, get, I'll I'll back you up here with a personal experiment. My wife and I just did. I mean, we're always we're, we're generally people that are interested in health and fitness. We've always have been. We enjoy exercising and we enjoy we enjoy food. So we we try to be good, quote unquote, and then we kind of go crazy here and there on the weekends and whatnot. But but we just did recently a thirty a whole thirty for for the month of of March, right? And. I don't think it's a fad diet at all. I would look at it and go, well, okay, it's a 30-day thing. They have a whole program wrapped around it, but the only right. rules are basically don't eat any processed crap, and there's no yeah. calorie counting. There's no yeah. there's no limit to what you ate. Her, my wife and I ate what you know we, we know we, we ate all the right foods, but we ate as much as we wanted, and we were full. We were yeah. never hungry. A lot of healthy fats, a lot of fats. So yeah. if I added the calories up, I probably consume more cap. Well. It gets a little hairy because I didn't, wasn't drinking alcohol, cut all, all the pizza on the weekend. So there might have been a calorie, you know, there was a, might have been a push and pull there. But but generally speaking, I was never hungry. I ate whatever I wanted, yeah. in, uh, you know, as long as it didn't have a, with the crap in the ingredients. And yeah. we both lost 
significant weight, you know, and and didn't really lose performance. You're still able to work out, muscle mass, maybe, you know, it wasn't it lost good the weight you want to lose. So, there, like once again, there's something to what you're saying. I mean, it just you know, it's there. Yeah, I I, I I totally agree with that, and that's and and that's what it's about, and and part of that too, right, is that to get back to what I talked about, this mindfulness, how you feel. Yeah. Uh, if you feel hungry, you know, what's that? There's that commercial, you know, I, I think it's maybe Snickers, right? Hangry. Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are, yeah. Right? And, and yeah, so if you're yeah. feeling like that and you're feeling stressed and miserable because you're hungry, you're feeling deprived, um, that has negative impacts in our health. We know that now. Yeah, yeah. So if we're going to eat, um, let us be happy about it. Let us yeah. partake. Let, let food be a source of joy. Um, too often, you know, I find from the medical community, we want to dictate to people, this is the diet, this is what you need to find, cut this out, cut that out, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah. And, and we make food work. Yeah. And food and the food experience for human beings has never been about work. In our DNA, food is social currency. Food is tied to the mating ritual. Mm. Food is all about Mike and Vinny's you know, great, 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 you know, ancestors sitting around a fire and, you know, one of us, you know, saying, hey, how about some ribs? Right, and, right, you right. know, then we start yeah. telling stories and and, and yeah. we become social primates. Yeah. And and so to take that out of the equation right. is, you know, what one thing I say in our class is you can't take the diner out of dinner. Mm. Um, yeah, then you're like just that. left with N, which is like, mm. yeah. <laughs> so and it, it makes no sense. Uh, so, yeah, but yeah. but, no, but you like get the, yeah. you know, the, the gist of the saying there. No, it's true. If you just look at it, I mean, and we have to wrap up here in a second. I apologize. We didn't get to, we didn't, I mean, we got to do this again because I do want to get to some of the other yeah. stuff. But um, Absolutely. So I, I, this has been a blast, man. And I could talk about this stuff forever. And I just think there's some basic tenets when you look at all the stuff. You can take a step back and, you know, you kind of, you need to see kind of the, the forest through the trees sometimes. It's like, okay, look at things you're eating. Did this thing exist 10,000 years ago? No. A thousand years ago? No. A hundred years ago? No. Uh, you know, and then you get to, you know, it, you kind of, okay, that should be a red flag, right? Does it come in a box? Should be a red flag. Does it have a label that's this long? You just... We all agree we existed 100,000 years. Well, I guess not everyone, but but won't get into that. <laughs> you know, like there are, we, we have biomechanical processes and that have yes. evolved to do certain things. And you just know, I'm like, I'm going back to, to the, the whole 30 thing. I mean, my wife and I, we were sleeping. When I tell you the sleep, you could, I mean, if she was in there, she'd tell you. I was, I would, I would wake up in the morning like, oh my God, that was just the best night's sleep. I mean, like, you know, because we weren't eating late, weren't eating crap at night. And it was just, you know, so there's a bunch of things and just eating wholesome foods. Again, as much as we wanted, really, and just until we stopped. And the sleep was miraculous. It was just, I'm like, oh, that's what sleep is supposed to be and, like, you know, so. <laughs> and, you know, one of the biggest risk factors um, in terms of developing obesity is sleep, sleep deprivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like that, that, that. Yeah, this is it's just evil cycle. And there, and as you mentioned at the outset, and, you know, follow the rainbow, right? Yeah. Um, and, and there's just a lot, uh, it's big business. There's, you know, Kraft isn't gonna, macaroni and cheese isn't gonna get out and support what Dr. Yeah, Ruby, Chef Dr. Not, Mike yeah. has to say, you know. Uh, Domino's Pizza ain't sponsoring me to get on Food Network and show people how to cook. <laughs> right. um, it's, I, I, all I can do is, is thank people like you yeah for helping me to get the word out. And, and as you said, you know, I'm, I, I just want to share what I have, take it or leave it. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm offering you the meal, give it a taste. If it's something that speaks to you, you want to uh, know more, learn more, uh, maybe adopt things like you talked about, well, gosh, you know, I'll, I'll try it. And gosh, darn it. I feel good. Right. Yeah. And you know, um, yeah, this is, this is the way I want to live my life. And somebody else says, you know, to hell with it. You know, I, I, I love going through the drive through every day and this is how I want to live my life. Right. That's a great thing. That's it's your choice, right. but as long as people have the information, yep. what bothers me is when it's it's misinformation that's propagated, or mm. things are not discussed honestly, or for a lot of people, Vinny, you know, and you talk about um, folks. I, I had a 28 year old. I had to do an emergent case on um, some years ago. It's one of the things that really spurred me to develop the culinary medicine course at the university. And I went in and talked with her the next morning. Um, it was a Saturday, Friday night. She came in, 28 years old. And I had to put a stent in her artery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were talking about food. And <clears> she <throat> just looked at me. She said, Doc, I'm trying. She said, but honestly, it's like eat eggs, don't eat eggs, all the things we talked about. She yeah. said, I just, just got so confused. Exactly. Yeah. I just did what was easy. And that's go through the drive through. And then, this is the kicker, Vinny. Then 
her lunch comes in while I'm sitting there. And what's on her hospital tray? Mm. Refined white bread, mm. a slice of processed American like <laughs> cheese food, a deli meat, right. green jello, because you have to have that while you're in the hospital. A salad that looked like, you know, I could have taken those uh, cherry tomatoes and played ping pong balls with yeah. them. White, white, And no then green. Yeah. A, a, a big tube of, you know, this, uh, you know, highly processed vegetable oil dressing thing. Yeah. And then a bunch of crappy condiments, including, you know, processed mayonnaise. Yeah. And he, this is, there it is, you know, literally yeah. um, on a plate. Yeah. Served by the hospital that's employing you. By the hospital. you represent. And, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so when she leaves, she said, "Say, well, what did I eat in the hospital? Because they must have given they me the best know. thing for me, <laughs> <It's, yeah. That's laughs> okay. right? Because that's the hospital; they the know." Irony. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. Yeah, the irony yeah. of it all. Oh, the sadness. Crazy. Well, well, again, we get, hopefully people, t you know, that people can, like you said earlier, it's it's their own relationship with the food, it's their own experience. You know, they'll hopefully take information Absolutely. like this and 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 do, make their choices. I mean, that's that's what it's all yeah. about. So, so Mike, let's wrap this up. Where can folks find you, and and what do you got going on? You got a couple books. You said what? So, if they just uh, pop on the web, go to www.chefdrmike. That's chefdrmike.com. Everything you need to know is there. Uh, there's links to the books. They're available on, on Amazon. Uh, there's descriptions of our course uh, that I teach at the university. Mm. It's 100% online, so we're offering that now to the public. Oh, cool. So folks can actually get a level one certification from the University of Montana College of Health in culinary medicine. Oh, neat. Um, if that's wow. something that may help personal trainers, mm. chefs, um, hopefully healthcare professionals, they want to incorporate that into their practice and their relationship with uh, patients. They can read about me, get some recipes, or um, follow me on social media and, and just drop me a line. Awesome. Um, may take me a day or two, depending on how call goes, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm just a simple, you know, one, one man guy. So I'll I answer all of those uh, personally myself. Cool. Well, very cool. Well, Chef Dr. Mike, thanks for your time today. I do appreciate it. Thanks, man.